Well, David was a tough undertaking last week. It's, it's difficult to preach about someone who is um, so present in the scriptures so much in one week. And if, if, if David is present in the scriptures, Solomon is present in the scriptures. It's very difficult to preach about Solomon in one week, but we're going to try to undertake this here and uh, do a good job for you because Solomon is, he's a rich character in the scriptures. And as I talk about him here today, I want you to think, David, like when you look at his life, he messed up constantly but he always came back to God. His son, Solomon, messed up constantly too. But there's the difference between father and son. Solomon never came back to God. He just kept going further, and f well, I probably should say farther. <laughs> Further's kind of the medical, met, metaphorical sense of distance. Farther's literal. He went farther and farther and farther and farther away from God. So I'm going to tell you a story today that's um, a pretty simple story. Simple's never simpler about Solomon. Let me give you some stuff that I'm not going to tell you about Solomon today. <laughs> and let me begin with this. Here in a minute, I'm going to read to you from the 17th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, okay? The 17th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy was years and years, and I don't mean like 20 years, I mean like hundreds of years before Solomon, okay? It was long before Israel even considered having a king. And when I read that to you from Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20, God is speaking through Moses. Moses is giving his commencement address before he goes up Mount Nebo and dies, okay? And one of the last things that Moses says to the Israelites is this. When you cross the Jordan River someday, and you settle in the promised land. You're going to look at all the other nations around you, and you're going to ask for a king. Now, when he said that to Israel, on the other side of the Jordan, they must have been thinking, what are you talking about? That is ridiculous. We would never ask for a king. And Moses says, you're going to someday. Yeah, Daniel said, just wait. <laughs> Hundreds of years from now, you're going to ask for a king. And I don't want you to have a king, but I'm going to let you have a king. And when I let you have a king, and then I'm going to read it to you. Your king better be this, and this, and this, and it better not be this, and this, and this. And so that's the standard. Solomon is Israel's third king. King Saul was the first king, fell out of God's favor nearly immediately. Second king, King David, who we talked about last week. King David is Solomon's dad. If you remember last week, I told you that David had an extramarital affair with Bathsheba. I'm not sure she had much say in the matter, but that's how it played out. When David murders Bathsheba's husband Uriah by sending him to the front lines of a battle, he takes Bathsheba as his wife. They lose their first child. One of their subsequent children is Solomon. Okay? When David is dying, there's a battle over dad's throne. David says, my son Solomon will be the third king of Israel. Solomon was the third king of Israel. 
I know you'll remember this. So a couple of Septembers ago, a bunch of us went to Israel. Ryan and I are sitting out on our little balcony area, and as Ryan and I are sitting there, I put one hand here, and I said, this hand is the Mount of Olives, and this hand is Golgotha. And I looked at Ryan and I said, all of time and history, the entire universe culminated between my two hands. That's pretty powerful when you're sitting there, isn't it? When you come up over the Mount of Olives, the very first thing that you see is the Temple Mount. On the Temple Mount is the Dome of the Rock. You can Google all of this, okay? When I got there, the first time I went to Israel, I said to our guide, who used to be the personal bodyguard from the Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, I said to him, how come the Psalms say that you go up to the temple and we're standing here on the Mount of Olives and we're clearly looking down? He said, because during the time of the writing of the Psalms, when the temple was built, when you looked across from the Mount of Olives, the temple was one level above what you're looking at now. So he said, put a temple and another temple on top of it, and that was the height of the temple that you would be looking at when you came up over the Mount of Olives. So when you come up over the Mount of Olives, you're looking up the mountain, but then your head goes like this to see this beautiful, massive temple that Solomon built. And then you go down into the Kidron Valley where the Garden of Gethsemane is, you cross the valley, and then you come up and you go up to the temple. The scriptures say when Solomon built the temple that the presence of God was so strong in the temple on the day of the dedication that the priests couldn't even go in the temple. That God's presence was so strong in the room that everybody had to back out of the room. They all had to leave the room because the power of God was so strong in that place. If you open your Bible, which I'm not telling you to now, but if you open your Bible to the middle of the Bible, you're going to land in the book of Psalms. Most of that book was written by Solomon's dad, David. If you turn one book over, you land in the book of Proverbs. Most of that book was written by King Solomon. Most of it, okay? He wrote the book of Proverbs. He also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? There's a season for everything. That's Ecclesiastes. If you've ever been to a wedding and hear, two are better than one, for they have a good reward for their labor. If one falls down, the other can pick them up again. If one is cold, the other can provide warmth. If one doesn't have defense for himself, the other can provide defense. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity. All is vanity. Book of Ecclesiastes. That is Solomon. Then he also wrote, I'm just going in order of the books of the Bible here. Then he wrote the Song of Solomon. Years ago... I played a song, I'll probably get an amen from this chair right here, from a woman named Heather Clark. The song is Kisses of Your Mouth. Why would you play a song like that in church? Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Song of Solomon because every preacher in the world is scared to preach from this book because it's kind of like the fifth grade film, you know? At times, it gets a little dicey. <laughs> the first section, chapter 1, verse 1 of the Song of Solomon, sounds a little something like this. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. That's your Bible. Now, it's interesting because when you read Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, He's talking about husbands and wives. And at the end of it, he says, now this is a great mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. The Bible says that Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. 
if you read Solomon's book of the Song of Solomon, that's what it's about. It's about God's love for humanity and humanity's love for God. If you want to know how it looks, that's how it looks. But we're so afraid of intimacy because of what beer commercials and lingerie commercials and everything else has made it. We don't understand pure, holy intimacy. Keep the marriage bed bed pure is not just about husband and wife. It's about the relationship of God and neighbor. That's what the book of Song of Solomon is all about. Then the scripture also says, and I'm going to show you this scripture because this is where we're going to land. Solomon was the wisest and richest man who ever lived. Now the world would say Jeff Bezos is the richest man who ever lived. You know, Bill Gates is the richest man. The king of Saudi or whatever. It's fine. Just get it. Solomon had a lot of cash and he was really smart. The Bible says Solomon would be the richest and wisest man who ever lived. So if you were tasked to preach about this, what do you say? No matter the amount of worldly wisdom and riches a person has, Christ alone is enough. Now that's a tough thing. <laughs> because both the easiest thing to or the easiest thing to say is both if I say to you, is Christ alone enough for you? Well, of course he is. That's the easiest thing in the world to say. Do you know what else is the easiest thing in the world to say? No. I'm not sure either one of those answers are right. One of the things that James prayed in the prayer room was this. Years ago, he heard the Spirit of God speak to his heart and say, James, I am very proud of you. And deeper and deeper still. I don't know if you've ever accepted Christ. I don't know. If today is the day, hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. God is very proud of you. And yet, if you've given your life to Christ today, hear the word of the Holy Spirit. God is very proud of you. Deeper and deeper still. Christ alone is enough. Amen. So, let me tell you the story about Solomon I'm going to tell you. When Solomon becomes king, he's worshiping one night. I believe the city was Gibeon. And when he was there, God showed up. So let me make this very real to you. My dad's sister had this terrible spine disease. In order to relieve the pain she had in her spine, they decided to do a surgery on my Aunt Patty. This was years ago. When they did the surgery on her, they severed her spinal cord and made her a paraplegic. So in her late 30s, early 40s, I think, because I was just a kid, she was confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. In my late teens, she had a stroke and died. Weeks before that, she woke up one morning and there was Jesus sitting on the end of her bed. They had a very good conversation. <laughs> Solomon is worshiping one night right after he is made king. And that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Now, I want you to think about that. If you're in a small group, this is the first question in the small group questions this week. If God showed up in the middle of the night in your bedroom and said, Hey, Rick, you can ask me for one thing. What would you ask for? I could probably say amen, be done, and the whole thing could just go on because I'm going to tell you what. What if you could ask God for one thing? 
Think of everything that people have asked for up here. God, I don't want cancer. God, I don't want my wife to have cancer. God, make my wife listen to me. <laughs> God, make my husband listen to me. He never listens to me. God, let us win our game today. Like everything has been asked for. God, heal my marriage. God, this. God, if you could, if like God showed up and said, you can ask me for one thing. What would you ask for? And Solomon, in the very first days of his monarchy, God shows up at the end of his worship bed <laughs> and says, you can ask me for one thing. And what does Solomon ask for? Solomon answered God, give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people for who is able to govern this great people of yours. If you go to Israel today, King David is still getting press. Their entire national logo is the star of David. Even Jesus himself is called the son of David. If you're following that, you want to try the best you can to live up to the standard that was left for you. So you have this young king who's taken over for his daddy. And God says, you can ask for anything you want. And Solomon says, I don't know what I'm doing. My dad, as imperfect as he was, was as perfect a king as he could have been in the fashion of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. God, would you give me wisdom? Because I don't have a clue what I'm doing. And what did God say to that? God said to Solomon, since this is your heart's desire and you have not asked for wealth, possessions, or honor, nor the death of your enemies, and since you've not asked for a long life, all of which has probably been prayed for at that altar, which puts everything into perspective now, but for wisdom and knowledge to govern my people over whom I have made you king, Therefore, wisdom and knowledge will be given to you. Now watch this. And I will give you wealth, possessions, and honor, such as no king who was before you ever had, and none will ever have after you. You will be the wisest and richest man who ever lived because you asked for wisdom and knowledge. What do you do with that? What do you do with that when God says that? I'm going to make you the smartest person in the world. Not just now, ever. And because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to make you richer than Jeff Bezos who owns Amazon. I'm going to make you richer than Bill Gates. Matter of fact, we'll combine the two and you'll still be richer. What do you do with that? When the Powerball hits 635 million, you won't even buy a ticket because you'll have that 10 times over, buddy. What do you do with that? When God came to Abraham, after Abraham was granted his Powerball, you know, Isaac, the son of promise, and God said to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and I want you to go to the place that I show you, and I want you to sacrifice him as a burnt offering there. What do you do with that? Abraham, in his mind, I preached this sermon like six months ago. We'll see if you remember. Abraham, in his mind, had to think, now wait a second. While the Lord doesn't tempt me, this is seriously a test. God pulled me out of a place where the gods that were worshipped there were pagan gods. And they required child sacrifice. So why would God, who pulled me out of that and said, have faith in me, why would he ever ask me to do 
that which he delivered me from. Hmm, God's asking me to do the absurd here so I can watch him do the impossible, and then we'll all live in victory. So when they're walking up Mount Moriah and son Isaac looks at Abraham and says, Dad, we've got wood for the sacrifice and fire and a knife, but where's the sacrifice? Abraham looks at Isaac and says, Son, don't you worry about that. God will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. And when they got up there, what did God do? Isaac wasn't sacrificed. God says, now I know. Look over there. There was a lamb for the sacrifice. When the Israelites made the golden calf while Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, and Moses came back down and saw what happened and then said to the Israelites, you are all in big trouble. I'm going to go up the mountain again and try to work this out. When he got up there and was meeting with God, and God said to Moses, who just a few months prior wasn't even willing to leave that same mountain to go to Egypt, he said, no, God, I'm good with my shepherding God, job. And God said, I said, and Moses finally went. Moses, who was not even willing to leave the mountain and go to Egypt to try to lead them out of bondage, is now back on that mountain again saying, I'm going to do the best I can to make sure God doesn't wipe you out. And he gets up on top of the mountain and God says, stand aside, Moses, because I'm about to wipe them out and start over again with you. What does Moses say? Don't do that, God. Kill me and keep your people. And then the world will know that you love them. When Jesus stands in the temple on days before he's going to the cross, he prays this prayer. And Father, what should I do? Pray? Save me from this hour? No. It's for this very reason that I have come. We stand in a place sometimes where it seems like the whole world is in front of us. And God says, well, how about that right there? And we have to say to God, you would never ask me to put my faith in that. I'm going to put my faith in you. Now meet me at Deuteronomy 17 again. Remember I said hundreds of years prior, God said one day you're going to ask me for a king. And I'm going to let that happen. And when I do, this is the kind of king you need to have. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. So they got that part right, correct? This is where it starts to go downhill. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make people return to Egypt to get more horses, for the Lord has told you you are not to go back to Egypt again. He must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom. He is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It's to be with him, and he's to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this laws and decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left and then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Now that's what God said through Moses hundreds of years before Solomon was even born. Long before Israel would ever ask for a king. 
And now God says, I am going to make you the king. You're the king that I appointed, and I, because you asked for wisdom, am going to grant you so much wisdom, you will be the smartest person who ever lived. And not only that, I'm going to make you the richest person who ever lived. Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him like the gods from your old land used to ask for their sons to be sacrificed. Moses, get out of the way because I'm going to kill them and start over with you. Abraham said, God will provide the sacrifice. Moses said, no way, God, that's not how you act. Take me instead. Solomon said, I'll take some chariots and horses. As a matter of fact, 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, and make sure you import them from Egypt. That's a little different than Deuteronomy 17, correct? Oh, and by the way, don't take many wives, because if you do, they're not going to be from Israel. They're going to be from outside of Israel, and they're going to lead you astray. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. Solomon followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so much for writing that book down and keeping it close to his heart. And the weight of the gold Solomon received yearly was 25 tons. I laughed at first service because I remembered where I got this jacket from. If you're old Morgantown people, you ready to laugh? Reiner and Core. <laughs> I got a jacket. I'm not sure I need a new one. Now listen to me. I'm not saying riches are bad. It's what we do with what we have. And if Christ isn't dictating everything that we have, we're not in a good place. When Jesus was at that dinner at Martha and Mary and Lazarus' house, and Martha got so mad, do you remember what Jesus said to Martha? Look at it on the screen. Few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Now think back to that request that you would make of God if he said, I'll give you one thing. What's the one thing? Is Christ enough? Because Jesus himself says, I'm the only thing you need. I'm it. You don't need everything, anything else. I'll let everything fall in place as it needs to fall in place. I'm all you need. That's scary. Jesus says it's a wicked and adulterous nation that seeks after a sign. And we've quoted this countless signs. Are there any sick among you? Call for the elders to pray for them. There's a huge difference between, I got to be healed, 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 versus, Lord, you're my healer. At the end of first service, I'm standing over here and a 35-year-old woman who'd been battling breast cancer, walked over here and said, I'm clean, Rev. I'm cancer free. And I needed to come here and say it. And I said to her, sister, there's a story in the Bible where 10 lepers come to Jesus and he heals all of them as they're walking away. Nine keep walking, one comes back. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? And God said to that one, bless you, because you're more interested in the healer than the healing. Only one thing truly matters. I don't care if you have money. It's okay. Does it control you? Is it your God? Or is Jesus your God saying, just give, just give. Everything has to be about the advancement of the gospel. Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. 
Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. I don't care if you have 12 jackets in your closet. I don't care. Just make sure you preach the gospel in them. <laughs> you get the point? Don't let the jackets be your God, you know? Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because if you care about anything else except Christ, you're to be likened to a pagan. If that's your life, then you're running after those things. Pagans run after those things. Your father knows you need them. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We're having this huge barbecue. Somebody showed up and said, we'll pay for the whole thing so it can be straight profit. That's powerful. I don't have the kind of money to pay for the whole thing, but somebody who does came and said, don't tell them who we are. Let us pay for the whole thing. Don't let your deeds be done where the whole world, you know, you know. If you ever debate after I die about putting a picture up of me around here, can I just put my vote in now? That's a dumb idea. Okay? Just say the name Jesus. That's, that's who we have to be. That's who he and I are. I used this example at first service. Friday night at the game, this kid gets hurt, his neck, and he's on the field. And what are the canes doing up in the bleachers? We're having a prayer meeting. And I look down there, and who's down on the field? Like, who else would you... Who else would you like want on your field? I'm just going to give you a hint. Who else would you want on your field if your kid was hurt on the field? This guy knows more about football than most people. He's not down there because of football. He's down there because of faith. That's the most important thing in the world. We pray every day for prayer to get back in schools. It was on the field Friday night. Lay hands on those. Who lifted the stretcher, the backboard? On one side is this guy. On the other side is Willie who plays drums. Who else would you want down there? Do you see what I'm saying? I, they both love football. Both of them played college football. If, but if you think these guys love football more than Jesus Christ, you're crazy. If you think they love it equally, if you think they love Jesus 51% and football 40 you're nuts. You are nuts. Christ alone. And that's the practicality of the whole thing. You know, I know this sounds silly, but go swim for Jesus. I mean, you see what I'm saying? You, you think like, okay, just, all right, let me go off script for two seconds. We're almost done, okay? I, James, you, I don't even know if he's in here, but he taught me this passage. So humor me for a second. I'm gonna sit in front of these swimmers because where are you from? South Carolina. South Carolina. South Carolina. What the heck are you doing in West Virginia? <laughs> where are you from? New Mexico. Woo! You don't swim. You just, you just made it into some swimmers. Pittsburgh. We'll pray for this one. <laughs> he is a Steeler fan. He was recruited by Pitt and he told him to stick it in their ear. Now, I want you to listen to this. Listen, this is very important because if you think you're here at WVU just to swim, you're crazy. You're crazy. Can I get an amen from the front row and not from that end? <laughs> Now from that end. Now, think about this. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and doesn't live in temples built by human hands. Solomon should have remembered that. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, 
He himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. You ready? Because here it comes. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. You think you're here on accident? You think you are in the time and the age that you're born on accident? God knew exactly when you were going to be born. And he knew exactly where he was going to put you. And why did he bear you and put you? God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not very far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. That's what it's about. It's not about swimming. I mean, you swim, you know. I think you should have bigger suits, just saying. Those things freak me out. But you guys are here for Christ. And guess what? I'm guessing you're probably not going to stay in West Virginia. What are you going to take home? Christ to New Mexico. And if you think that God wouldn't bring you to Morgantown, West Virginia to deepen your relationship with Christ just so you could take it back home, you're crazy. He's done crazier stuff than that. So swim like a son of a gun, but make sure you always have Christ driving that. What do you always say, Daniel? Make your platform your purpose. Your platform isn't swimming. It's Christ but you're in a platform of swimming. So while you're there, make it Christ. Make it Christ. We'll finish with this. Friday morning, I'm leading morning prayer. I thought, God, what do I tell them at the end? Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? That was the scripture morning prayer Friday, and I was like, I'm pretty dumb, Lord, but yeah, I got it. Who will bring us prosperity? God, I don't need 25 tons of gold. And frankly, this is a decent jacket. Let the light of your face shine on us. That's all we need. That's all we need. You remember that this afternoon when you want the bears to win. Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy. See the contrast? When their grain and new wine abound. They're going to think this is about bread and wine. I know bread and wine. This is my body that's given for you. This is, you see it? That's my blood that shed. Christ alone. And the reality is, when you live like that, in peace I'll lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. That's it. That's all. We're done. No matter the wisdom and the riches you have, I want you to decide right now that Christ alone is enough. If you've never given your life to Christ, make today the day and hear God say to you, son, daughter, I'm very proud of you. And if you've made that commitment, hear him say today, son, daughter, I'm very proud of you. Deeper and deeper still. Deeper and deeper still. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you and we give you praise. Thank you for these who have come out today who have heard this message. It's no accident that they're here. And I pray, Lord God, that as the praise team sings in this moment, that people respond, that they hear you say, I'm very proud of you. Always go deeper. Jesus, I prayed this at first service, and I think I need to say it now. A few weeks ago, you said to me, Kevin, what's consecration? What's it mean to be consecrated? What's it mean to be wholly set apart for me? What's it mean to be sanctified? And you gave me this image. It's imperfect people walking alongside the perfect God towards perfection. And you let me sit in that for a little while. 
And I realized that that wasn't the answer. And you went, so what is the answer, Kevin? It is imperfect people walking alongside the perfect God. But I'm not walking towards perfection. I'm walking with perfection. I've been walking with you all along. And if I'd stop worrying about trying to go somewhere and get something, and if I just turned and saw, you've been here all along. I don't have to seek perfection. I just need to turn to you and receive you, who are perfection, in all of my imperfectness. That's it. Christ alone. I pray that for every person in this room here today, God. May we all, as imperfect people, commit to walking with you. God, as people come, as they respond, I thank you that they're getting good news today. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.